Welcome to the webinar on economic development and opportunities with PACE within the DFW region. We are so glad you could join us today. My name is Charlene Heidinger. I'm the president of the Texas PACE Authority. And uh, we are um, going to ask you if you have questions to put them in the chat box or the Q&A box and we will respond uh, during the webinar. And we will have a Q&A section at the end as well. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Carlton Schwab, the president and CEO of the Texas Economic Development Council. Next slide, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, and, and thank you for being a part of this uh, uh, important webinar. My name is Carlton Schwab. I'm the president of the Texas Economic Development Council. And uh, I'm also a board member of the Texas PACE Authority, and I'm delighted to, to be here today to talk about the Metroplex region. Uh, if you'll uh, move the slide to the, to the next slide. A little about us. Um, we are the largest association of economic development professionals in the country, with about 875 members. Uh, 250 of those members are in this massive uh, region uh, we refer to as the DFW Metroplex. Uh, it also represents some of the best um, economic development professionals and economic development organizations, not only in the state of, the te uh, in the state of Texas, but I would argue uh, in the country as well. Next slide, please. Um, we are a professional association um, like uh, most other professional associations, uh, we're involved in uh, developing our professionals uh, and their organizations. We lobby the Texas Capitol for uh, good pu public policy measures in support of economic development. And then we, uh, we do conferences, networking, training, and offer uh, three different award programs to um, really identify and recognize the success of our economic development organizations uh, at the local level. Next slide. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, the, the Metroplex region um, uh, shaded in the box there in green or like olive green is a, an unbelievably dynamic region um, really a, a recession-proof region in terms of the diversity of its uh, major employment sectors, uh, one of the highest growth regions in the country, consistently the highest growth region in our state, uh, and, and just a, a, an, an incredible driver of economic activity and economic development, which provides uh, not only the, the major cities and, and their attributes of Dallas and Fort Worth and the uh, suburban uh, high growth areas, but also exurban areas that can take advantage of, of some of the uh, reduced cost of operating manufacturing uh, and, and logistics industries uh, in those areas. So you get a little bit of everything from the Texas Metroplex region and you get a dynamic economy, uh, one of the most, uh, as I've said, one of the most dynamic economies uh, in the US. Um, and, and included in that uh, rapid population growth, again, this, this area has been growing for not just years, but decades. Some of the highest uh, growth uh, population, uh, some of the highest population growth in the country uh, particularly in the sur suburban or no north suburban Dallas uh, counties of Collin and Denton, and then to the east of their uh, Rockwall and Kaufman, um, high uh, annual uh, income rates, again, uh, well exceeding the state and national averages. And uh, again, if you look at just the sheer job growth in the last decade, over 750,000 jobs and, and many, many of these jobs are jobs with huge multiplier effects. So you can see these are the kinds of jobs that, that uh, uh, 
uh, not only raise the standards of income, but they produce the kind of, of multiplier effects that really what those of us in the economic development world are seeking. Um, the Metroplex is uh, the region uh, in our state that consistently exceeds both our state and national averages. Next slide. Thanks for your time and allowing me to introduce uh, this webinar. Um, we are the Texas Economic Development Council. We're proud to be involved with the Texas PACE Authority and uh, we hope that you have a great day today. Thank you. Carolyn, you're on mute. I'm just gonna take a few minutes for those of you who may not be as familiar with PACE. Uh, thank you for your patience. Um, move very quickly so we can get back to economic development. But the problem we're trying to solve is that uh, measures to make properties more energy efficient and water uh, conserving costs uh, have huge upfront costs and they have long ROI. So any property owner, manager, or developer who is looking to show value often talks about savings. But what we really need to do is change that conversation and talk about how these measures create value. Um, there, that's across the board, but financially, uh, projects that uh, make buildings and facilities more energy efficient and water efficient, increase net operating income, increase internal rate of return, and increase asset value. But there's a problem to reaching these uh, benefits. Next, please. It's always the question, how are we going to pay for it? And so for the first time, the private sector has access to long-term upfront 100% uh, affordable financing provided by the private sector and local governments who establish PACE programs create a mechanism uh, to do that without, uh, without having any uh, taxpayer dollars used or having to create uh, an internal bureaucracy to run the program. Next slide, please. So what is PACE? It's a local economic development tool, um, moving the responsibility for payment from uh, the company based on income to the property itself based on the resulting savings of these improvements. It's 100% upfront, low cost, uh, long-term financing provided by lenders in the private sector. And the program can be used for improvements to property uh, that make it more energy efficient, water conserving, or creates power on site uh, and reducing demand. So we're talking about measures that also provide benefits of safety uh, in terms of um, uh, COVID and also uh, resiliency in terms of storms or un unanticipated loss of uh, connectivity with the power grids. The program can be used on commercial property, including nonprofits, industrial property and uh, apartments with at least five units. Next. So uh, we have um, requirements on these uh, traditional financing that it has to be repaid in five years. So I call this repayment period a tower of pain. And, and you have to pay off the cost of these improvements before you get access to the savings that result from them. PACE uh, is long-term so what we're really doing is just knocking that tower over so that the property owners have access to the utility savings immediately to help um, uh, provide the finance or to provide the funding to repay these projects. In other words, if you stretch out the payments long enough, the projects will pay for themselves. Next slide, please. So the uh, Texas pay statute was adopted in 2013 a huge group of amazing volunteers, over a hundred volunteers spent a year designing a model program, which has been adopted by 55 local governments. So we reach uh, 60, a little over 60% of the Texas population and we only have 222 counties to go. But we're excited about the growth in the DFW market and we have, um, across the state helped facilitate as a nonprofit, we do this as a public service, but we've facilitated about 123, over 123 million in PACE projects and a good 40, 45% of that is coming from the DFW area. So this is a wonderful time to talk about the program because 
the concept is being proven in Texas and uh, there are a um, number of great projects in the DFW area and we're delighted to talk to you about all of that today. Next. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin Spath um, with the city of Dallas. Thank you, Charlene. I'm Kevin Spath, Assistant Director with the Office of Economic Development for the city of Dallas. Um, I will try and talk fast and limit my remarks to the five minutes that I've been given, but uh, no guarantees. Rob, real quick about our office. We are a full service in-house department of the city. We're not an external organization or an instrumentality of the city like an EDC or a CDC. We are city staff. We're organized according to five functional areas, area development and redevelopment, business development, which is typically our office and industrial uh, job creation function. Uh, we also have included business uh, diversity, business inclusion and workforce development functions this year in our new budget year. And we have a, a, an accounting and performance monitoring uh, group as well. And then a small community development function. Next slide, oh, we're on it, sorry. Um, real quick, thank you to Charlene for putting this slide in. Um, it might be a little bit dated, but this is sort of our pitch. We're the best city in the best region of the United States. Um, we're at the urban core of the largest and most diverse. Um, we are the urban core and the most diverse city in the nation's fastest growing and fourth most populous metropolitan area. We account for approximately 37% of the region's office market, including almost 40% of the region's large corporate headquarters, 35% of the region's total hotel market, 25% of the region's industrial market. Next slide. The bulk of our toolbox is comprised of two basic tools, um, our public-private partnership program and our TIP or tax increment finance program. A public-private partnership program is what uh, you probably know as the Chapter 380 Local Government Code grants and loans or any abatements that may be facilitated by various state statutes like 378 of the Local Government Code, Neighborhood Empowerment Zones, or 312 of the Tax Code, uh, Tax Abatement Reinvestment Zones. We also leverage state programs like the Enterprise Fund and the Enterprise Zone Program. Um, over the last three calendar years, we've had some success. 33 projects we facilitated through this uh, public-private partnership program, 11,000 jobs and over $1.3 billion of investment leverage. We also have a whole bunch of supplemental tools like new markets tax credits, EB-5, and property assessed clean energy. In 2012, we saw PACE as um, something we wanted to get into. We were an early adopter. We saw how it could be win-win-win for property owners and local contractors and the city itself. In 2013, we uh, actively lobbied for the, the PACE Act to be signed into law. In 2013 and 2014, we actively participated in the working groups through uh, what Charlene was talking about with the PACE in a box. In 2016, we established the first city enacted PACE program in Texas and we also competitively procured a third party program administrator, also the only one in Texas to be pro, pro, uh, competitively procured. In 2017, we did our first PACE project, which at that time, and I think still to this day, is the biggest PACE project in the state at $24 million of PACE financing. Over 2018 and 2019, we closed three more projects, including the smallest PACE project in Texas at 74,000. And in 2020, we integrated PACE as a key component in our Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan, or CCAP. Next slide. Here's a quick overview spotlight on the projects we facilitated through property assessed clean energy. Um, I would say that PACE is complementary to other tools in our economic development toolbox. And nearly all of these projects and most of our pipeline of projects come out of the city's incentive application process. And PACE helps property owners and developers maximize private capital and helps the city stretch our limited public resources for funding gaps in these critical redevelopment projects. The top left picture 
is the Butler Brothers building. This is a historic circa 1910 uh, building, 600,000 square feet. It sat vacant for probably a decade. And with the help of Pace Financing in 2017, it was converted into 270 hotel rooms and 230 apart 238 apartments. It was uh, virtually worthless on the tax rolls at $2 million before the project, and now it's $55 million. It involves a complex capital stack layered with EB-5, state and federal historic tax credits, and PACE financing debt. The center project, center top picture is the Continental Gin Building. Again, another historic building that was redeveloped with the help of PACE financing. In 2019, it, it involved uh, state and federal historic tax credits, PACE debt, the city put $3 million of TIF money into the deal, and it's also in an opportunity zone with OZ equity. The far right top picture is the Dallas Payton Body Shop. This is a small business in Southern Dallas, and with the help of a $74,000 PACE loan, they were able to convert uh, most of their power system to solar. So this is uh, quickly a, a recap of the PACE financing. We've had 35, almost $35 million that have facilitated total project costs upwards of 163 million. That's about one, more than one fifth of the capital that had been needed for these projects. And then we also track on the right-hand side of the chart, all of the environmental metrics. So the amount of carbon dioxide reduced, the electrical uh, energy saved annually in kilowatt hours and the gallons of water saved annually. So that's, I think I've stayed under five minutes, Charlene, but that's a quick recap of the city of Dallas. And again, I think the, the takeaway that I want to, to leave with everyone is that PACE helps a city stretch limited public dollars to fund gaps in critical redevelopment projects. Thank you. If I can get myself unmuted, I guess I'll go ahead and start. I'm Lisa McMillan, and I'm the Economic Development Coordinator for Tarrant County, which, uh, as everyone knows, is um, the Dallas's better half to the west. So I want to talk a little bit about our program here at Tarrant County. Um, next slide. And the next one, Bill. As you can see, Tarrant County is made up of 41 municipalities <clears throat> and eight, excuse me, 864 square miles. Our population has almost doubled in the last 20 years and we're continuing to grow. We were approached about PACE by Charlene back in early, I think, 2016 and it took a while to understand the project, but we realized then that PACE was a, a great tool to add, not only to the county's economic toolbox, but to enable to add to all of those 41 municipalities under us in that toolbox also. Because by having a program from the county level, it enabled a singular program to work with on all those um, cities too, and it, it provided continuity. Next slide. Our first, even though our program was established in late 2017, we worked for all of 2018 to start to get the word out in Tarrant County, and we didn't have a project until 2019. So since 2019, we've had four projects, and we'll get into those in a little bit, but um, we've had over $15.4 million now in PACE investment just from those 2019 projects. And we estimate 191 or more jobs have been, in, have been created because of that. We have one new project for 2020 and three additional ones pending. Next slide. I wanted to go over some of the projects that we have on hand so far, and it's a variety. And I think that's what kind of makes um, this unique on this tool. You're really helping a variety of type of projects. It's not just the industrial or commercial that we're used to in economic development. We have a small nonprofit family service, ACH Child and Family Services, that has used a little over $500,000 to do um, HVAC and other type of, of uh, improvements to that facility. 
and that is in Fort Worth, in South Fort Worth. And then the Hilton Garden Inn, which was relatively newer property, but needed to do some um, energy efficient additions up in Grapevine, also utilized the program um, with an assessment of just over $6.6 .6 million. Next slide. This one is something that I think a lot of people are really excited to see. The historic ISIS theater in um, North Fort Worth, North Fort Worth, <laughs> what we call the Stockyards area. Um, it's under, under construction right now. Um, they used a PACE assessment of just over $2.3 million and are renovating that facility. It is estimated that um, they will be opening hopefully at the end of 2020, that uh, facility uh, provides a 500 seat theater um, that will house live and live events and movies. So we're excited for that addition to the stockyards. Next slide. The Kempton Hotel is a historic 1921 building that's on the historic register. It was actually um, a former home to XTO Energy. That building is being renovated from office to hotel. Uh, the assessment on that is going to be just over $5.8 million currently, but the project is much larger. It's almost $50 million in investment um, for renovation and furniture and fixtures for the hotel. This building involves multiple tax incentives. This is in downtown Fort Worth, and I'm going to let Phil talk about that later and when he talks about the cap stack that was involved in this um, redevelopment of this facility. The other building that we're um, working on with newly financing for 2020 is the Sterling building. It's an office building in uh, the, it's in Fort Worth, but close to the Keller area. And it's uh, using 5.8 million in, in PACE financing for um, energy efficient lighting and HVAC. Next slide. We are excited about what um, the future holds for PACE in Tarrant County. Um, we've got a lot of cities, as I showed you, and we're hoping to expand this program out to Arlington and all the cities in between. Um, in addition, we've got a couple of uh, projects in the pipeline and another uh, historic building in downtown Fort Worth, actually two hotel projects in downtown Fort Worth that we're working on and a smaller church project in Fort Worth area. So we found this to be something that can be utilized for a variety of our businesses. It, it adds to our tax base by encouraging the redevelopment of aging infrastructure and, um, and increasing jobs for our contractors and the um, employees of the reuse of those facilities. So we're excited about PACE and we wanna get the word out in our community. Thanks, Charlene. All right, I'm Allison Cook with the City of Farmers Branch. I'm Director of Economic Development and Tourism for um, our city. We border Dallas, so if you know where Dallas is, then you know where we are. Next slide, please. Um, so for context, I always put where the gallery is because most people know where the gallery is in all large cities. So here um, on your map, on the east side of Farmer's Branch is the gallery for context along the Dallas North Tollway. Um, and so today we don't actually have a PACE project that I'm going to show you because it's in review. Uh, so when we reconvene in a year or two, I can have some pictures and numbers for you and we can all talk about how it went. Uh, but for now, I'm going to just give you more information about where Farmers Branch is and why this is a perfect opportunity for PACE projects. Next slide, please. So our city population, we have almost 50,000 people, which is hard to believe. It's grown over 40% in the last 10 years. Um, we have a pretty low tax rate in comparison with other cities. Um, and our trade area employees and trade area meeting home value, it's a five mile radius. And so you can see that we're bordered around some of the major highways, 35, 635 Dallas North Tollway and to our far north is the George Bush Turnpike. Next slide. Our west side of town, that's the lingo we use for anything that is west of 35 and north of 635. And we have a Mercer Crossing development 
Um, it's a large development that's been going on for the past few years. It's a lot of single family. We have a lot of multifamily and we do have two new office buildings going up even in this market and a retail boardwalk. So we do have a lot of infill development on our west side of town that's fully entitled and will be built out. Next slide. The east side of town. Um, this is a real gem for PACE projects. So if, when investors call, I always point them to this region of Farmers Branch. It's bordered by the tollway in 635. And um, this was an area that's a lot of industrial that was built out in the 70s. And so it's not the type of industrial you would build today for industrial use. So we see a lot of retrofitting of these buildings. And um, for kind of zoning and marketing purposes, we broke things color coded map. And so you see a creative core and community mixed use and industry and things of that nature. But we have a lot of buildings that are being retrofitted now with a variety of uses. And so um, this is kind of a great area to focus on when you're looking for infill um, development, redevelopment. Next slide, please. So PACE primarily, um, I know it has multifamily component, but primarily deals with the industrial and flex buildings. And I just wanted to show a quick map. I get all my sources from CoStar. So this is a CoStar map of flex and industrial properties. And you can see they're on the west and east side. The hole in the middle are our homes. So we have all residential in the middle of the city. So the east side and west side, prime opportunity for this project. Next slide, please. And numbers tell stories. So if you wanna know the health of an area, if you're an investor, I know you're gonna pull some of these things. So I thought we'd pull it today. The occupancy and market rent per square foot, uh, the market is the blue line and the occupancy is the orange staggered line. And he, as you can see right now, the occupancy is teetering around 94%, which is very healthy for um, uh, industrial and flex sector. I, I grouped them together for this purpose. And Farmers Branch has 476 buildings in those two sectors uh, per CoStar. And most of our light industrial, zone light industrial was built around 1970, and we are primarily a built out community, um, which just screams redevelopment opportunities. So we also have a facade grant program. So talk about capital stack. Facade grant program is money that goes to owners of the building, um, typically very dated buildings that want to do something on the exterior. It's capped at $50,000. So it's a little something extra um, that you can do in addition to PACE and um, other financing tools. We're a tier, tier two market. Um, meaning tier one being more of a dense downtown market like Dallas. So these tier two markets usually have a little more affordable properties that you can scoop up. Um, not much. Prices definitely are going up in this city for commercial property, but you still can find some great deal of existing buildings that can be value add projects. Next slide, please. I think it's interesting always known who owns your asset. So it's asset value by owner type. And as you can see, uh, and this is for industrial and flex sectors, primarily it's private, private money, got a little bit of public um, and re user, meaning the tenant, and it got some institutional money, just a little bit of private equity. Uh, sales price per square foot is pretty strong for um, existing industrial older properties, um, about 80 a square foot. Pretty decent low cap rates too. Next slide, please. And this is just a plethora of some of our large employers. We don't have one dominating use. I would say here we have many uses. We are very diversified that we definitely saw during COVID of non-essential and essential. We have a little bit of everything, which keeps our market very strong and stable. But we have everything from home security to wine and spirits to um, eyeglass manufacturer and sporting goods. So call me directly if you have questions about infill properties and Farmers Branch and PACE opportunities. Charlene can explain all the details about PACE. Thank you, Allison. Good morning. My name is John Boswell. I'm the Director of Economic Development for the City of Corsicana and for Navarro County. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Corsicana is located on the south end of the DFW region and what we like to refer to as the Texas Triangle. Our location gives us easy access to 
the Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston markets. Uh, many businesses are attracted to Navarro County and Corsicana because of our location and the ability to move goods throughout the state and the United States, uh, particularly on uh, Interstate 45, the US Highway 287, or State Highway 31. Uh, those businesses that need rail service um, have uh, the opportunity from two uh, different major rail lines, the Union Pacific and Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railroads, uh, both have service uh, in Corsicana. Uh, proximity, if uh, proximity to an airport is important, um, we have a, a local uh, Campbell Field or within close proximity to Dallas Love Field, Waco Regional uh, Airport, uh, DFW, and even Houston Intercontinental. Some of the incentives that uh, are important to, uh, you can go to the next slide, are uh, that we have our new market tax credits. Uh, those have been uh, used quite a bit recently. Um, we have the opportunity zones, and of course, we use tax abatements. Uh, those new businesses that are looking to uh, move to uh, move or expand their operations to Corsicana and Navarro County are, you know, are choosing to join a list of, of well-known companies that are already here. Of course, our Russell Stover is the largest Russell Stover candy uh, manufacturing facility in the United States. Um, really can't talk about Corsicana uh, without talking about the Collins Street Bakery. So as we like to say, uh, Corsicana is the sweetest town in Texas. But there are an awful lot of other great manufacturers and distribution centers, True Value, Coles, Guardian Glass, Audubon Metal, of course, Canada Mattress Company, and so forth, that you see on that slide. Just a list of some of the businesses that are here. Uh, next slide, please. We do have one uh, PACE project that was done here. Um, the RJ Levy Athletic Lettering Company uh, was looking to move into an industrial building that was vacant. Um, that project uh, had a total assessment of $324,559. The term was for 20 years. Um, what a neat part about this project is it created, and uh, there are 60 new jobs in, in that facility that weren't there before. Uh, the building, 36,000 square feet, built in uh, 1979, and you can see uh, the HVAC and the uh, uh, savings that they were able to get uh, doing the PACE program. So uh, we'd like to do more of those industrial uh, PACE projects here in Navarro County, and we think we have some, some great opportunities. So if you're interested in learning more about, uh, next slide, about uh, Corsicana or Navarro County, uh, please feel free to uh, give us a call. We'd love uh, for your business to locate here, grow here, or expand here. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. My name is Phil Gehave, and I am the shareholder at Munch Heart and the leader of the uh, public-private partnerships practice. Uh, my practice mostly uh, works with uh, developers and owners who are looking to use sort of more alternative methods for creative real estate finance, whether it be tax credit programs, such as historic or new market tax credits, or you know, P3 programs with uh, partnerships with cities and universities, and more recently, the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program. And so what I'm gonna do with the balance of our time here today is kind of give you some of the nuts and bolts related to how you can sort of take advantage of the program. And as you have clients and customers and potential prospects who are looking to invest in your communities, how you can pitch this program as another way for low cost, long-term financing for a particular project. So a couple of key features of a PACE loan. So first and foremost, a PACE loan is considered a voluntary assessment lien, meaning that it has the same priority as a special assessment, and it's a lien that's voluntarily imposed upon the property under Chapter 399 of the Local Government Code. A special assessment cannot be accelerated upon delinquency or even an event of default. So just like any of your real estate taxes, if you default on your real estate taxes, the government can certify that you've defaulted and put your property up for a tax lien sale, but they can't collect you know, all of the future taxes that you may owe over the next you know, 100 years. And similarly, with a PACE assessment, the term of a PACE assessment is between 20 and 25 years. And so if there's a default on the PACE assessment, the only amount that can be collected is what has been delinquent or is then currently collected. And that's a key feature when you're talking to lenders and other investors insofar as there's a priority of the PACE assessment for one year's worth of PACE assessments 
over sort of a senior lender or any equity in the capital stack. Third, the PACE assessment amount is determined by a couple of different factors. First, there's what we call the savings to investment ratio of at least 1.0 to 1. And that means that the savings that you anticipate generating from the installation of the improvements has to be projected over the useful life of the improvement to exceed the amount of the PACE assessment. So a good example of this, as we'll get to later, is that if you install a new HVAC, for example, there's an engineering report that the TPA and Charlene's group will review, which will indicate you know, how much savings are generated from that versus the cost of it. And, and they wanna make sure that you, um, the cost is sort of uh, amortized and sort of baked into the payments that you're receiving. The second factor is that the cost cannot exceed the total cost of the qualifying improvements. So a good example, which we'll get to in a second, is the Kimpton and Fort Worth. So while it may be a $40 million renovation project, only about $6 million of those costs related to qualifying improvements. And so that's why the loan was sort of relatively small compared to the overall size of the project. And finally, even if the qualifying improvements are, you know, but well beyond you've satisfied these tests, there is a key underwriting requirement required by the Texas PACE Authority and other sort of uh, PACE administrators that it cannot exceed 20% of the as completed appraised value of the property uh, without a waiver of the local government. It's common for that number to go up to 20, 25% of the as completed appraised value, but a waiver is, is typically required. Fourth, State law requires that in the event there is an existing lender or even a construction lender who's closing their loan at the same time, you must obtain that lender's consent. And that has to do with the fact that as a special assessment, it primes the mortgage at least for that one year's worth of PACE assessments. In addition, the PACE assessments are essentially they're treated as a loan to the, to the developer or the borrower. The loan is typically between four and 7%. It's a fully amortized loan over a 20 to 25 year period. Um, depending on the structure of the deal that you're working on, we've seen as low as uh, three, 4% in terms of a bond financing for large transactions. Most transactions we're currently seeing in the market right now are between 5% and 6%. And they're typically provided by ca uh, private capital providers who are, uh, there's a, a variety of them now in the market. Um, PACE assessments can be passed through to tenants. So typically in your leases, you'll see sort of the uh, requirement that all tenants, especially for you know, single users, are required to pay triple nets or all real estate taxes. And typically they have to pay special assessments. Um, we, you know, that's sometimes negotiated with sort of single use tenants, but a lot of times we do see landlords in particularly multi-tenant office situations passing through a portion of the PACE assessment. So that's another way that owners can sort of install these improvements and also pass and spread the, the sort of uh, cost of those improvements to the actual users of the project. In addition, we've also seen PACE assessments, the cost of them pass through to users and guests. So if you ever go to a hotel in certain markets and you see on your folio once you get it that you can charge a green fee of you know, one or two dollars per night or one or two dollars per stay, Typically, that's uh, sometimes related to the operation of the hotel, but a lot of times now it's actually being used to fund a PACE reserve to pay for the PACE debt service. Further, PACE assessments cannot be used for new construction unless the lot is undergoing development or, is, or was already developed. So for example, if you want to sort of have an existing building and demolish it and then start new, it's PACE, technically PACE eligible. Uh, the Grapevine project that Lisa talked about was actually um, constructed on a parking lot adjacent to an existing hotel, but they were able to qualify it because it already had utilities and other items necessary for the development of that track. So that is some, a quirk in the statute currently that I know there's a lot of folks are, are thinking about changing since certain states like Colorado permit new construction even in green fields, but uh, currently the Texas statute does not permit that. Uh, finally, um, Texas PACE assessments typically cannot be used for completed projects unless the developer had a present intention to, it's not just use PACE financing, but to actually sort of install qualifying improvements within uh, a 24-month period. And a lot of this has to do with, um, you know, digging up some of the information related to um, 
energy efficiency improvements and conscious desires to pick one sort of HVA system over another in order to qualify for, for rebates or energy credits. And so that, that's a, a high standard. And I'd recommend that you talk to Charlene and her group at TPA before you have a customer or client that wants to you know, propose a retroactive baseline. So why are developers using PACE? So I think Charlene covered a bunch of this, but first, PACE permits owners to amortize the cost of these expensive improvements over the life of the improvements. So as she showed in her graph, a typical loan has a cliff of five years versus a PACE loan, which has amortized payments over a 20 year period. Uh, the treatment as a special assessment permits the successor owners to pay for those benefits. So if I'm gonna spend a million dollars on installing you know, a new HVAC or even solar panels on my roof that reduce my energy costs, you know, I may not get the benefit of the, the return on investment over this, but with a PACE assessment, you can spread that over a longer period of time and the pay, and a special assessment follows the land. Third, energy efficiency and water reduction technology typically reduce operating expenses. This graph shows that the theory of the program is that you have this 20 year loan, and then at some point you've got a, um, you, you've got enough operating savings where you've essentially paid off all of the sort of, you know, pace assessment as well as the uh, initial uh, cost. And so you're reaping the benefit of, of these operating savings over time. Uh, fourth, because it's uh, a priority and activity in the secondary market, pace assessments tend to be less expensive than mezzanine debt or preferred equity. So from a finance perspective, we see a lot of clients really attracted to the program because this fits within that interesting space in the capital stack where senior lenders don't wanna go higher than maybe 60% loan to value, but the developer doesn't have 40% of the equity to put into the project. Case can sort of bridge that gap a little bit, and reduce the senior loan a little bit and, and reduce the equity requirement. So by doing that, you sort of reduce the overall weight of the, of the sort of uh, average weight of the cost of the capital. Uh, next, PACE lenders are typically underwriting projects on eligibility and not and, uh, less so on project cash flow and the ability to repay, which makes this a more flexible tool currently. Uh, and finally, because of the nature of a special assessment, you know, as you'll see in a minute, PACE can be a very flexible source of capital that can be combined with other capital sources, such as new market tax credits, historic tax credits, city grants, loans, EB-5, mezzanine debt, you know, you kind of name it. So one of the key hurdles to getting a PACE project closed is uh, obtaining mortgage lender's consent. So this is required under statute. And so we get a question of why would I ever agree to have a one year's worth of PACE assessments be senior to my, to my loan? And there's a couple of reasons. So, so first, PACE assessments are only senior to that one payment. So typically, that's a very underwritable risk for a lender. Um, they do not affect the ability of a lender foreclose on their property. So they can foreclose, but they have to take subject to the PACE assessment. PACE assessments can also be reserved. It's very typical that uh, lenders, much like they do with real estate taxes, will require that one twelfth of the PACE assessment be reserved from the project cash flow so that they know the payments are going to be made. And oftentimes we see funded reserves up front to agree to a PACE loan of maybe three to six months, even a year's worth of a PACE assessment so that they have some knowledge that they'll have time to work out a, you know, a bad situation. Also, if the SIR is greater than 1%, then that generally means the savings generate increased net operating income, which could improve the value of their collateral. Further, Oftentimes, the negotiation between the owner and the lender is that the lender would like to see the PACE assessment repay a portion of their loan and the, thereby reduce the amount of leverage they have on their loan. And I can tell you that in the current capital market, what we're seeing is that a lot of lenders see that as a very attractive proposition, whereas for a construction project, they would typically go to 60 or 65 percent of the capital stack. Now, with a PACE assessment, they're saying, I want to be at 40 to 50 percent. And the developer still gets some savings on their equity, but at the same time, the lender gets to reduce their risk to the project, thereby giving them a little bit more comfort for, for making the loan. And finally, you know, PACE loans are fully funded at closing, so uh, there's typically no disbursement risk. This is oftentimes a real concern when you have preferred equity providers, mezzanine lenders who, who may or may not be 
large institutions uh, where senior lenders are concerned about whether or not that party is going to fund when the time comes. And this example is the Butler Brothers project in Dallas that Kevin talked about. And, and really, the, the, the reason why the developer here did that project was that they had a very expensive mezzanine loan at 15% on $22 million. With the PACE loan, they reduced their cost of capital by almost you know, 2%, and thereby sort of repaying this expensive mezzanine loan and providing more long-term debt for the project. Now, when we talk about alternative capital sources, you know, uh, there's a lot of different programs that were mentioned that, that PACE can sort of be involved with. And I've highlighted two projects that have used these real quickly. So the Barfield Hotel in Amarillo used federal and state historic tax credits, as well as an opportunity zone investment. Uh, the Weston in Dallas, uh, excuse me, in Houston was uh, done on ground lease financing and also included a large senior loan, as well as federal and state historic tax credits. But some of the challenges related to putting PACE into your capital stack are one, by virtue of the fact that the PACE loan is, is foreclosed through a tax lien process under the uh, Texas Property Code, they can't provide sort of the typical intercreditor agreements, subordination non-disturbance agreements, or recognition agreements for tenants, lenders, and other parties in capital stack. The most they can ever give is really an extended notice and cure period. And even that extended notice and cure period has to be tied when the PACE lender has a requirement to deliver a notice of delinquency to the county in order to enforce their tax lien. If they miss that date, then essentially they have to wait a year and they've agreed to forbear for a year, which is nothing that any PACE lender wants to do given that most of these PACE loans are, are sort of securitized on the secondary market. Furthermore, um, there's lots of capitalized interest and fees on these loans. I'll say that there's two types of structures that we're seeing right now. One, which is a private capital provider just providing a direct loan to the project, which is by far the simplest and most cost-effective method of doing that, but it's also the most expensive. So that's where the interest rate gets at that six to 7%. The second type of transaction we see is more of a bond conduit financing transaction. So for the Butler Brothers project, a uh, private, uh, the public finance authority out of Wisconsin issued the bonds, which were then sold to a insurance company. But for small, for bigger projects, you can sort of afford the cost of bond counsel, underwriters counsel and all that. But even for small projects like the ISIS Theater in Fort Worth, which use the same process, it becomes a lot harder to justify that amount of cost for say like a $2 million loan. So as you're sort of talking that through with your borrowers and your clients and customers, that's just something to consider as you're working through your, your first PACE programs. And finally, disbursement procedures. So the Texas statute does not require that um, PACE assessments only be used for uh, qualified improvements. And a lot of times that really kind of messes up how construction disbursements are being used. Uh, typically we've gotten PACE providers to agree to sort of an audit at the back end of a project to make sure that there were sufficient qualified improvements uh, for the project to justify the pace amount. But that is something that, that is still being worked out within the market that we always sort of have to negotiate. So a couple of different projects that we wanted to highlight for you that are really practical. So I know that uh, a lot of folks have given you examples of how they've used it, but we wanted to give you two very good examples about how pace can help a project you know, get off the ground. So the first project, which you know, uh, Kevin can talk about a little bit as well, is the uh, Continental Gin Project, which is located in the Deep Ellum neighborhood of Dallas. This involved the renovation of a, uh, uh, the Continental Gin Building, which used to be one of the largest companies in the cotton industry in the late 1800s and 1900s. And at one time, was the largest manufacturer of cotton gins in the United States. So the current owners were a family office uh, based in Dallas. And the building was previously used as an art exhibition and incubator, but the current owners decided to reimagine the building as a 21st century creative office space with co-working managed by Common Desk. The key factor here is that this project did not have a key tenant in the building. So as you can imagine, that makes construction financing very challenging for the project. Furthermore, based on property condition reports for the project, it needed extensive renovations related to the project, in addition to some additional infrastructure work that needed to be performed in the, in the parking lot of the project. And so the city of Dallas um, 
was able to provide two types of incentives. The first one was a TIF incentive, which was provided only after a significant underwriting was uh, accomplished and with you know, the help of PACE being uh, put into the project. So as Kevin indicated earlier, you know, city dollars, grant dollars are really last dollars in versus PACE, which was, you know, sort of had to be considered in the project. And what you'll see here is that we calculated that um, over the term of the PACE loan, it uh, generated sufficient benefits of about $11 million. And so an SIR of 1.09, which satisfied the uh, underwriting requirements for Texas PACE Authority, but also shows you that the savings over time were intended to sort of pay off the loan um, as, as the project got over the hump. So what's interesting about this project is that it involved multiple incentives. So first we have the city of Dallas's $3 million TIF grant, which is not paid up front, it's a reimbursement paid over time. So it had to be bridged into the project. Also, this is a qualified opportunity zone project. So you'll, you'll see here a sort of simple qualified opportunity zone uh, uh, structure in which equity contributed to the project by the sponsor was um, qualified for that incentive. In addition to that, you'll see uh, federal tax credits were used in the projects and we have a federal tax credit investor as well as a state tax credit investor. And the value to a case is that what you'll see here, what's in interesting is that the frontier state bank loan, which is the first lien is only 33% of the project. And the PACE loan is 14.10. It was very challenging to find any lender that wanted to do the project, but such a low LTV with the other incentives being fully funded and with the PACE loan providing a significant gap filler, the developer was essentially able to uh, execute on a $37 million project. Uh, the project is anticipated to be completed actually next month and hopefully they'll be uh, you know, blowing and going in, uh, in January of next year. If anyone's looking for an office space in Dallas. Uh, the next project, which Lisa talked about, was the renovation of the former XTO Energy Headquarters building, which is located at 714 Main Street in downtown Fort Worth. Uh, this was the former Farmer and Mechanics National Bank building, and which was constructed in 1921. And at, until 1957, it's 24 stories tall, was the tallest building in Fort Worth. Uh, the building was purchased by XTO in Energy in 2007, and just a little factoid, XTO's uh, former CEO loved historic buildings, so he actually owned about five or six large historic assets in Fort Worth, and served as its headquarters until 2018 when XTO was purchased and, um, and they started divesting their uh, building assets. So a development group uh, called DSG in Memphis, Tennessee, purchased the building in 2018, and plan to convert the building into a 226 room Kimpton Hotel, which is sort of an upper upscale hotel owned by a IHG known as the Harbor. So the project is anticipated to open in spring of 21. It was anticipated to open this year, but obviously this is a terrible time to open a hotel. So they're sort of uh, delaying their opening a little bit. So what's interesting about this is that you still see, you know, uh, an interesting capital stack where you have uh, a senior loan, which is lower than 65% at 55. You have state and federal tax credits involved with the project. And you also have a PACE loan of $5.9 million. Now, as Lisa indicated, well, it's about a $50 million renovation project, as you can see. Why did they only get you know, $6 million for uh, what is essentially a $100 million project? And that has to do with the fact of what were the improvements that were actually installed in the project. And so this picture on the, on the sort of right side of the screen talks a little bit about exactly what the improvements were that qualified, and then their useful life, their estimated energy savings, and then how though that was the sort of cost of the, uh, uh, the PACE loan. So you see that the $5.5 million for the cost is a little bit lower than the PACE loan amount. And that's because there's a capitalized interest uh, fees and other expenses related to obtaining the PACE loan that were capitalized into the, the full amount of the PACE loan. I will also note, and this is a little interesting too, that the city of Fort Worth provided additional incentives to the program, uh, to the project, including a $650,000 TIF uh, grant, which obviously is paid as a reimbursement after the project is completed. In addition to this project being eligible for the sort of convention center hotel uh, incentives for 
rebates to the city of Fort Worth, a state hotel occupancy taxes, as well as state sales tax rebates under Texas tax code sections 156 and 151. What's interesting about that is that in order for the project to qualify, the city of Fort Worth is going to have to own the ground at some point. And so there's actually a option and sale uh, uh, agreement where they will convey the property to the city of Fort Worth, the city of Fort Worth will lease it back, and uh, the uh, owner will then own it for 10 years in order to maximize the benefits of those rebates that are being provided by the state. Um, that provides an interesting issue for case loans insofar as a case loan can be attached to a ground leasehold interest since it is a real estate interest that can have a separate tax parcel identification number. So one of the big issues that we've always had with ground lease interests on for, for case loans is, well, what happens if the, if the ground lease interest goes away and, and who's going to enforce the case assessment? And that, that's something that's sort of an emerging area that, that you know, a lot of folks are working through in terms of how to underwrite that risk. But it is something unique to this particular project, and it's definitely coming up in other projects throughout the state. So I know that was a lot of information, and I think that at this point, um, we're going to open it up for questions. I see the chat box is uh, very um, uh, sort of uh, heavy. But um, Charlene, do you want to? jump in and uh, ask any questions to the group. First of all, Phil, that was fabulous. And we hope um, inspiring to the audiences who are interested in establishing PACE programs in their jurisdictions, but also especially for uh, developers and uh, property owners and managers who've struggled with um, how to manage some of the necessary improvements, uh, but also, um, looked at PACE as maybe a little too complicated uh, to get their attention, but with COVID, the market has really changed. And so thank you for laying out uh, those opportunities for everybody. Um, really appreciate the speakers today. Great, um, great opportunities to know uh, that there are so many places in this area to, uh, to um, speak. Phil is to uh, do business. Is everybody um, unmuted for questions or are we gonna use the chat box, continue to use the chat box? Um, why don't, if you guys, if anyone has a question, you can either raise your hand in the participants box and we can unmute you real quick. Or if you wanna ask questions in the uh, question and answer, we have one from Libby Tucker. Great, uh, Shirley, great. this Perfect. is probably for you. What's the process for cities to be a participating jurisdiction? Okay, so um, the group that created the Pace in a Box model that um, the local governments represented on this call today, uh, it, that Pace in a Box model is um, plug and play for local government. So all, all of the documents are available to you for this process. It's a two meeting process. Uh, the local government uh, posts a report on the website on how the program will work, uh, the details of it, and then the, the local uh, elected body passes a resolution of intent uh, to establish the program and sets a hearing date. And that uh, alerts the public to look at the report and then to comment at the hearing. So then the next meeting, uh, and you can spread this out over more than two meetings if you choose, but then the next meeting in this order, there's the public hearing and then the local government uh, considers a resolution to establish the program. And if the local government through an interlocal agreement or a professional services agreement decides to outsource the administration of the program, then the local government also approves that professional services contract or interlocal agreement. Uh, we have another question from Stuart uh, McGregor. Uh, does the city need to become a PACE community if the county they are located in is already a PACE designated? Absolutely not. So Tarrant County uh, has done uh, all of the work for everybody in Tarrant County, just as Navarro County has done all of the work for Corsicana in the other cities. Uh, and the advantages of doing this at, at the county level is that you only have to do it once. It's the same amount of work, whether a city or a county creates the program. But the other advantage is that all of the unincorporated areas are also included in the program. And when you think about it, that's where agriculture and industrial, a lot of agriculture and industrial properties are 
and we hope to serve them as well. And when you think about the water needs in the DFW area, um, it's important to be able to access uh, as many uh, properties as possible that they have access to the program. So you're off the hook if you're a city in a county that's already established the program, you get all the benefits. Uh, question from Kathy Bonville. Uh, why hasn't Dallas County um, adopted a, a PACE program? Devin, you want to answer that? I don't know. <laughs> Actually, um, the good news is that Dallas County uh, is um, getting preparing its resolution of intent to establish the program. It's posted a report on its website and it has a hearing scheduled on December 15. Uh, to hear from the public about it. And right. um, we are so grateful for the city of Dallas and the city of Farmers Branch. Uh, and they will um, continue to operate separate programs. And it sounds like uh, Dallas, uh, in fact, we're very encouraged to know from the report that Dallas County is following the pace in the box model, enabling this uniformity in seven existing governments in the DFW area to um, to have uh, the same program. So we're excited about that. Yeah, if I really quick, the, the, I mean, the real story there is that we were in conversations with Dallas County back in 2015 and 2016 when the city of Dallas was really raring to get our program started. And then a little thing called Ebola hit Dallas County and all of their attention uh, shifted to that for you know, 12 months, and then uh, it's just taken this long for them to get back into the game. This is a great conversation to be having today because um, when this program got started in uh, 2015, Travis County became the first local government to establish the program. Dallas followed very shortly after that, uh, the city of Dallas. Um, nobody knew whether this was gonna work. This was really a completely new idea. And the Texas program was much more free market based uh, with, with high quality underwriting and technical uh, standards required. And so um, now uh, the model is proving itself, right? We're proving the concept. Uh, many more local governments are on board. Uh, a significant number of projects, both large and small, urban and rural have closed uh, successfully. And, so now the conversation is much easier than it was um, in the beginning. Like nobody wanted to go first. Uh, and so we're very grateful for those early local governments that jumped into the breach and helped us prove out the program. So it's a different conversation today. And, um, and we're finding local governments joining uh, much more quickly because a county judge can pick up the phone and talk to any of the county judges that already have the program. And, mayors and city council members are doing the same thing. So it's a much easier, quicker conversation. One of the challenges about PACE is that um, this is not easy to get your arms around. Uh, Phil is one of the best communicators I've ever seen uh, in talking about some of the details and how some of the more complicated projects are being put together, but they're not all that complicated. Still, um, local government officials have fiduciary and um, uh, fiscal responsibilities to, to their constituents, and it takes time for them to be assured that they are very protected in this program, and it's really not going to create a big bureaucracy, and it's not going to use taxpayer dollars. Uh, but then property owners have to understand it. And so for a property owner who says, I'm ready to go, um, they need contractors, architects, engineers, MEPs, um, lenders who understand the program. And so We've spent in years building that foundation, that infrastructure of people to serve the property owners and help get these projects done. And so what that's done for local communities and is create jobs, right? When you think about it, what we're unlocking is probably the last untapped market in Texas. And that's deferred, um, deferred maintenance on these properties. If property owners can finally afford to deal with the deferred maintenance in their properties, that means somebody's manufacturing equipment, somebody's delivering it, somebody's installing it, somebody's maintaining it, somebody's feeding those folks. And then when these beautiful little buildings go from empty shelves to 
places of employment were creating permanent jobs, which I didn't really appreciate until the Levy Project in Navarro County. And that was a huge uh, kind of head slap for us in realizing that we were going to be able to do more for local governments than we ever thought possible. But then when you think about um, the renovation, uh, particularly of older or empty or underutilized buildings, that changes the economy for blocks around it. Uh, that's the best example that we heard today is that, that Amarillo Barfield project. For 25 years, that building has had busted windows and boarded up, um, boarded up doors and windows on the first floor. It's going to rejuvenate uh, blocks around it uh, in, in its economy. Hey, Shirley, quick question, follow up on um, whether or not if a county has already adopted a program in a city, what, what would be the advantage of the city um, adopting a, a resolution, if any, if the, if the county- I don't see any advantage. It, it confuses things. The value of the pace in a box model that seven local governments in the <laughs> DFW area have already adopted is that it's the same. So the property owners, the lenders, the contractors, everybody in this new economy we're trying to create only has to learn one program. It's, you know, it's a, uh, the documents are the same, uh, everything's the same. So if you own seven Burger Kings in DFW and they happen to be in three different um, jurisdictions, uh, you can negotiate with one lender and one supplier and get everything you need for all of those projects together. Uh, and the advantage of keeping it uniform is great. So overlapping doesn't really make a bunch of sense. Uh, in fact, what we'd rather do is work with local governments who have the program in their uh, jurisdiction already uh, is to say, let's do education and outreach and let's make sure your chambers, your EDCs, your property owners uh, know that they have access to this tool. So um, it's better if we all partner together to take advantage and keep it as simple as possible. Um, having said that, we are also trying to do workshops to train, uh, train the service provider side on the, on the technical aspects of these uh, projects. And um, you know, part of the challenge is getting people to come to the, come to the webinars or come to, you know, can't do anything in person now, but we will again. And so if we collaborate on the outreach, uh, we're going to, uh, create more economy faster. Uh, we have an engineering question from Jim Phillips about useful life of HVAC hot water heaters being 10 years, not 20 years. Jim, just going to say I'm not an engineer, but <laughs> we had, we had a, a third party engineer uh, look at this. I don't know, Charlene, if you have uh, any comments about, about that. It depends on the equipment. And when we are um, reviewing the a projected life of the equipment, we look at the manufacturing specs. And, um, and they will differ, but um, that's, we rely on ASHRAE standards and ASHRAE auditing procedures. We uh, didn't reinvent the wheel. Uh, we, we have fabulous engineers and, and engineering organizations. Um, and we look to the standard tools that are used today by them. Um, Governor Perry, when he signed this legislation, made it very clear that he wanted um, high quality technical standards uh, that would be uniform throughout the state and uniformly applied. And we work very hard to do that. But instead of doing it in house, we wanted those engineering jobs to be created in, in your communities. And so um, the PACE lender is usually the one that selects the independent third party engineer. They have to be licensed in Texas and they have to stamp their reports to us, uh, and they have to certify that they're independent of the projects. But we work hard to, um, to um, have everything in this program be high quality because it has one reputation. And uh, the savings, everything is based on the savings that are going to result from these projects. So we, we need them to be successful, and we need them to be legit. Uh, having, um, anyway, it's... Uh, it's a neat opportunity. Uh, uh, Jim, the reason that the life of the equipment is important is that the statute says that the, the PACE assessment, the financing term, cannot be longer than the projected useful life of the improvements. And so it's critical that the, um, 
that we know what those are. If it's a multiple measure project and for these bigger buildings, we with PACE, you can do everything at once and there are significant advantages to that. So different measures will have different lifespans and we will look at a weighted average to determine uh, the longest term possible. Hope that answers the question. Um, we also had a question from, and I saw you answered it in, on the comments, Charlene, from uh, Craig Holes, just kind of about the foreclosure process, you know, what happens with the senior lender. Um, so it's very common for PACE loans to have uh, lockout periods that don't permit prepayment. Sometimes that's one year, sometimes it's three years. A lot of times they'll have ramping down prepayment periods over the first 10 years, you know, upwards of I've seen some PACE lenders ask for 5%. And hat tip, if your borrower asks for that, you need to tell them to push back. That's way too much. Um, but uh, I would tell you that if there's a foreclosure, the senior lender is subject to all the prepayment penalties that are contained in the PACE financing documents. Because essentially any new owner, whether through a foreclosure or through a voluntary transfer, takes title subject to the existing PACE documents. So, Something we negotiate very heavily on our side is we're very mindful of assumptions of this loan and whether or not a future buyer is going to permit that assumption of the loan. And you can pay it off more often than not, but it can be expensive to pay it off. And so a lot of my clients, whenever they sort of evaluate the sort of period of time that they intend to hold the property, it's usually less than the PACE assessment. So they, they usually think about refinancing or selling or, or things like that. But what they're trying to do is sort of lock in what they hope, sometimes not given COVID, is a lower interest rate now that in 10 years, when inflation hits or when interest rates start creeping up, ends up being a lower cost loan that, that sort of reduces a new owner's overall cost of capital. Now, that hasn't played out very well in the last year and a half, I'll be honest with you, since interest rates are at historically low numbers. But the long-term play is that the interest rates environment will, will go beyond zero at some point and that you know, folks will want to take these loans on as the assets start trading. So Phil, that, uh, that's, uh, I'm glad you highlighted that question. One of the things that local governments um, need to know is that while the pace in a box model has been designed to minimize uh, any intrusion into cost or staffing, there is one uh, place where the local government um, does need to step up. And we hope it never happens. Uh, but so far, the hardest thing local governments have been asked to do is to create the program. And once that's done, it pretty much goes on autopilot. However, the local governments do agree to enforce past due assessments for the capital provider if somebody defaults on a payment. Um, the good news is that the only thing that can be collected is the past due payment. It's not the whole amount because these are tied to the land and the future payments haven't happened yet. Like taxes, you don't pay them in advance. They're not taxes. Um, however, the statute makes very clear that if that unfortunate worst case scenario happens, the local government is entitled to the same attorney's fees, taxes and penalties, uh, that they uh, receive for past due defaulted taxes. And um, the statute says if that's not enough, then uh, whatever they need to cover actual costs is to be provided out of the property. They don't have to take the property over. They don't have to make the payments if they're missed. Uh, there is, uh, the local governments never touch the money, but they may have to step in and do the enforcement. And with the exception of Travis County, which is the only county, I think local government that collects their own past due assessments, this would most likely be handed off to the debt collection firm who collects taxes for the past due taxes for the local government. So we expect even in this worst case scenario that it would be a, a de minimis intrusion um, on the local government. But, but uh, I like your notes, Ryan, because this has come up a lot. So it, you know, it's very typical for any loan document you're a borrower in default, you've got a 15 or 18% immediate interest rate hike, right? Just because you haven't made a payment. Under the PACE loan documents, that default interest goes to the PACE capital provider. It doesn't go to local government. 
the local government under the pay statute gets to charge the 12% plus the costs, et cetera, to actually enforce the lien. So there's a lot of motivation from a borrower owner perspective to make sure that all of that's cured because we're talking about upwards of almost 30% in some cases of a charge against delinquent amounts that would have to be paid a portion of it to the capital provider for their sort of lost opportunity for payments and a portion of it to the local government to defray the cost of enforcement. Thanks, Phil. And one of the things to share with everyone is we hope this never happens. Um, and we've done everything we can up front to make sure it doesn't happen. So the group that created Pace in a Box, um, including the mortgage bankers, the Texas Association of Business, the Texas Association of the Manufacturers Association, the um, TAC, TML, uh, Conference of Urban Counties, we all worked very hard to make sure that, this, that these projects would be put together in the first place to make sure that they're successful and we don't have a problem at the back end. So that's why there's a savings to investment rate ratio of greater than one. That's why the PACE loans are capped at 25% of the <coughs> value of the property. Um, there is a that's why our technical standards are so thoughtfully um, created and frankly mirror the state's uh, technical standards manual for uh, a similar program that is run out of the State Energy Conservation Office for local governments. It's, it's all very high bar, um, high quality best practices, uh, even in the way it's administered. Um, we're a nonprofit, we do this as a public service, but the whole idea is that these projects will be successful from day one. And that's a bit of a challenge in Texas because we have lower energy and water costs. But in an area like DFW where there are challenges to water, there's tremendous demand for power. Um, this is an opportunity to help everybody use less and free up those resources to uh, help address the growth in your amazing uh, communities and, and part of the state. So we're so grateful that you joined us today. We're a little bit over time. Um, I'm, uh, I'm amazed at these great speakers and, uh, and we hope we've inspired people to do more business in the DFW area and to see that PACE can help make that happen. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>